Thank you. This is on, right? Uh, and thank you for inviting me here today. It's a pleasure to come and share a little bit of what we've been doing at Johns Hopkins SICE on uh, our China Africa loan database. And just to put in a plug, um, we are uh, launching, we've just issued a call for proposals for uh, people who want to use the data. The data is going to be released on Chinese lending in Africa in April, um, but we are welcoming proposals now. You could look at our website at SICE-CARI.edu um, SICE for more information about that call. So. Um, this also is, uh, is very different from Maggie's and more like Scott's presentation in that uh, this is all research in progress and, um, and, it just, and it also includes some of my thinking about some of these issues here. So uh, is Chinese lending risky business for China and Africa? And I want to talk about four risks here. Um, the first risk is uh, asset seizure, and this is one that's gotten a lot of publicity. A lot of countries have been concerned about this. Civil societies have been concerned about this. I don't know that that many governments have been, but it's something that John Bolton and uh, our administration has warned about, and uh, this is also something that originated in India with the case of the Hambantota port in Sri Lanka. So uh, Brahma Chalani is the person that invented the whole meme of debt trap diplomacy. So this idea of asset seizure, so our countries um, at risk for this from their Chinese loans. And the second area is commodity price risk, and this is a, a risk on both sides for the lender and the borrower. The third risk I'll talk about very briefly, and I was hoping that we would have the other paper on our panel, which um, is talking about the risk of hidden loans, um, but that didn't happen. Um, and then finally, moral hazard risk, and this is where our research has been developed more uh, deeply, so I'll spend more of the time on that. So first of all, just to walk you a little bit through what we've um, got in our data, we've got um, lending um, from China to Africa from all the Chinese lenders that um, all sources of Chinese loans, including the Chinese government with its foreign aid loans, uh, interest-free loans, um, contractor loans, and then the main Chinese banks, the China Development Bank, China Exim Bank. And uh, starting in 2000 and going through 2018. So you can see there's a lot of unevenness here. Um, in this slide, we pull out the uh, lending for Angola because Angola really uh, takes, uh, in some years, more than half of this lending. So in 2016, it's quite anomalous. So you can see in the blue um, uh, lines down underneath the red there, it's uh, lending from to all the other countries in Africa in our data. So it's dipping from a high in 2013, going down in 2016, a little bit up in 2017, and then down again in 2018. So uh, in this slide and the rest of the slides, we take Angola out. So this is uh, Chinese lending by lender. And um, as you can see here, again, the China Export Credit Agency, the Exim Bank, is a dominant lender and has been for a long time. Um, but the China Development Bank has also been moving in. And uh, if we had the Angola loans in here, China Development Bank has become a large lender in Angola, along with the China Exim Bank. But the two banks on the left, the Exim Bank and CDB, are the two policy banks. So these are the official lenders um, from the Chinese government. Um, we've also got a, a very small amount. The black there is a, uh, these are either loans that we couldn't tell which entity they came from, that they came from China, or they're the Chinese foreign aid instrument, which is the interest-free loan. So that's a very small amount of the, of the lending going in. We also see um, a, a uh, significant and, and growing category, which is syndicated loans. And what we've got here is only the syndicated loans that were all Chinese participants because we couldn't tease out what was Chinese and what wasn't Chinese when the Chinese are, are joining in with other lenders. So if we had that information, we, we put it in the database, but otherwise we kept those out. So these are the kinds of uh, the lenders there. So the, the first risk here is um, uh, this risk of asset seizure. And this is one that's uh, gotten the most publicity. So we have uh, Brahma Chalani, who's described this as a, a deliberate attempt by the Chinese to overlend to countries so that it could actually grab their assets when they couldn't repay them. So the debt trap diplomacy idea. And, and rather than data here, I have pictures. <laughs> because um, as it turns out, there, there is actually 
there are actually no cases of this. So there has never been a case of asset seizure, including the case of Hambantota in Sri Lanka, uh, which is a, a case of a privatization of a port rather than a, the Chinese coming in after a default and, and coming and seizing the asset. So uh, a lot of countries are concerned about this. Um, we're doing a paper on this in which we're looking at the uh, at different Chinese loan contracts and um, what they have in there in terms of arbitration or what happens when the countries do go into default or have problems uh, with these loans. Where did the arbitration take place? And then what kinds of sovereign immunity um, have, have countries claimed or, or given up or waived in these contracts? So that is an interesting issue. But this is really, it's a very standard kind of commercial loan clause that we see coming into these Chinese contracts. And it's very unlikely that uh, it could ever be enforced. So the second risk is a commodity price risk. And I think this is a, a much more significant factor. This slide here is of, um, Uh, this is a quick proxy of that commodity price risk because it shows uh, those high rates of growth in sub-Saharan Africa during the time when commodity prices were high. And this is not, of course, for, for every country. Um, but when commodity prices sank after the global financial crisis and the drop in demand, you can see that drop in growth. And then there's been a decline since then. And so this does affect um, Chinese lending. So what we've done, we haven't actually done a deep analysis of this, but I just wanted to uh, play this out here. So we've got, the uh, again, the growth rates there. And then we have the lending on a year-by-year -year basis, again, uh, excluding Angola. And what we can see is that um, the lending did peak in 2013. And it has been going down, but it's still high. So in the, and when the growth is really dipping, the Chinese lending is not dipping as much. And so it's it's reducing, but it's still keeping at a, um, a higher level than, than the growth, uh, perhaps, that would enable these countries to repay. So that's certainly a risk here. But I wanted to um, focus in on one case, which is Angola. And uh, this is a, uh, one of the cases in which the, there is a, a whole system of lending from uh, Chinese banks for infrastructure and is commodity secured. So uh, Angola has recently um, promised to not continue with this kind of lending and borrowing modality. But uh, most of their loans from China um, up until the recent past have uh, taken that kind of form. And so I wanted to look at, just as a, a kind of a quick sketch, what does it look like in terms of how much um, China, uh, Angola is exporting to China in terms of the oil um, revenues that are coming into the country? Of course, they don't control all of that uh, income. And then what do the, the loans on an annual basis look like? And what we can see here is that uh, in, in every year, except in 2016, there's been a, a very ample um, gap, anyway, a very ample room um, for uh, at least for um, foreign exchange coming into Angola that would be available. And what our um, a research team of ours that was in Angola a year ago uh, was told that the this commodity, the escrow account that is filled by the oil exports um, under an arrangement in which they have to have a certain amount uh, to cover the, um, the loan payments that are due at any particular time, uh, it has always been amply full. And so they haven't actually had to, they haven't gone into default on their Chinese lending, at least according to the interviews that we had um, in Angola. And so um, <coughs> uh, it looks, at least in this particular case, as though that modality has been, by and large, working out for them. Um, in other countries, that is not, like in the Re Republic of Congo, it's clearly not the case. So a second risk is hidden lending. And uh, by this, uh, the paper by Sebastian Horn and Carmen Reinhardt et al. is referring to lending that is not reported um, to the IMF and the World Bank under the data reporting statistics that are supposed to be collected from all the different borrowers. And so um, they have a, a very interesting, elaborate paper that tries to tease out how much hidden lending there is. And let's see. Um, our, uh, they used some of our data in their analysis, but they haven't released their, their actual data, so we don't know 
you know, how much of our data is actually being used there, and then what it, um, what it refers to. So the, the hidden lending, I think in part, could come, I think it's a much uh, smaller problem than their paper estimates, uh, but I think there is a problem with hidden, hidden lending, and that comes from this group, in part, this group of Chinese contractors, and my research just hasn't put this together, and I, <laughs> I haven't actually gone through this, but uh, okay, we'll get them all up there. Is that all? Nope. <laughs> There's AVEC. So I don't know if you, oh no, okay, so that's good. <laughs> That's a, a number. I asked them just to, you know, put up some of the contractors, and these are all um, the the different uh, entities that have. They actually get export um, sellers credits from China Exim Bank, so they borrow from China Exim Bank, and then they on lend to the borrowing government. And this comes in as suppliers' credits. It comes in as commercial credits. Uh, governments um, put this up in their balance sheets as different kinds of things. And sometimes it's quite transparent, and sometimes it isn't. And so that, I think, is the kind of thing that perhaps they're not reporting. It's not official lending, even though these are largely state-owned enterprises. They're not uh, official banks. And so uh, in our data, let's see if we have this coming. Oh, this is just one example of one of these um, entities, China Road and Bridges Corporation. And you can see this, this is their... Um, there are different uh, overseas locations, and they're quite thick in Africa. So they have, they are actively seeking work. So um, this slide here is uh, from uh, China's official data on infrastructure contracts. So this is the amount of money that Chinese companies are, are uh, winning. It's the revenues that they're getting across Africa. And it's uh, about $50 billion a year. And you can see, again, this has gone up very sharply, and then it's been leveling off and slightly declining. So we juxtapose this in the next slide with um, the amount of loans that are going in on an annual basis. Again, this excludes Angola. And so as you can see, the, the, uh, even if all of the Chinese lending to all of these countries was all going to these construction projects, which most of it is, although not all of it, um, it's still, there's a whole lot of uh, business that they're getting that is not being financed by these Chinese loans, but quite a bit of it is. So these export sellers credits, um, they, they come, the contractor, this is uh, from the China Machinery Engineering Corporation prospectus that was published in Hong Kong, and it explains how this process works. And as you can see, there are many different steps in it. Um, this is also why I think a lot of these, um, uh, a lot of, of, of the people that are trying to put together databases, um, when they, uh, the contractor applies for expert seller's credit, these, these different steps are often um, looked at as being an actual project is, is happening, but it doesn't actually happen until further on down the process. Uh, there are many steps. So this, um, these expert seller's credits, they're all repaid by the contractor themselves. So this is, they borrow from the Exim Bank and then they um, have to repay the Exim Bank. So, and the, uh, there may or may not be a sovereign guarantee. In this particular instance, they're getting a sinosure to approve and issue an expert credit insurance policy for it, but that's not always the case. So this contractor and company finance, it's not official lending. These contractor loans often go to the state-owned enterprises. They may lack a sovereign guarantee. They may not be reported. Um, and we're also seeing them showing up in PPP projects and uh, special purpose uh, vehicles. And these are all, these are off budget mechanisms for infrastructure development by their very nature. And so they don't show up necessarily in the official government reporting. And then there's another area here, which I think um, uh, is, falls under the hidden lending, and that's the advanced payments for oil exports. And we can see this, um, we don't see this in very many cases in our data. Uh, but we do see this in South Sudan, and that's um, the Chinese oil company, CNPC. So this is a um, the picture of the loans that we could that we could identify as coming from Chinese contractors and Chinese investors as loans. So um, moral hazard risk. Uh, this is the one that we've uh, developed most fully. And this comes, I think, um, I was struck by this quotation from the president of the Economics Association of Zambia, in which he said, ah, oh, you know, what we really have to worry about, the larger part of this quotation is, he said, we have to worry about the euro bonds. Chinese, ah, oh, they can easily be renegotiated, restructured, or refinanced. And when I saw that, I thought, no, that's not what we're seeing in, in our data. 
So um, there have been a, a couple of uh, reports that have come out in the past uh, 18 months about Chinese debt cancellation and debt restructuring. And I think they've created this really er erroneous idea that the Chinese are just, they're going to cancel your debt fairly easily. So we looked um, uh, into our data. We have 103 cases of debt cancellation in Africa between 2000 and 2019. Um, and we couldn't, we couldn't in every case come up with a quantity for what had been canceled. Uh, but these are the cases in which we did have a quantity. So Zambia, Rwanda, Cameroon, Mozambique, these are the ones in which uh, there's the largest. But you can see the amount is still really small, 350 million or, or 400 at the highest. So what are these? In every single case, 103 of those, these were the interest-free loans. And this is what the Chinese have pledged to do. Um, and this slide here, we have the different pledges that have come out there um, with the the red boxes, these are the dates in which the Chinese made pledges about the debt cancellation. And all of this is post-HIPIC debt. So it's all, it's parallel to the HIPIC program. It's for the zero interest loans, which are a small proportion of what uh, the Chinese have actually lent out. And so if countries think that the Chinese are going to be canceling their export credits or their commercial loans from China Development Bank, uh, they're sorely mistaken. Uh, that is that every interview I've had on this and every example that we have is no interest in canceling those, those loans. So, um, and the interest-free loans are a very small proportion of the total lending. Um, the, the red here is the proportion, the percentage here. In the early years in 2000, the zero interest loans were a high proportion of what the Chinese were lending. But as the Export Credit Agency and China Development Bank ramped up their lending in Africa, it became a smaller and smaller proportion. So the, um, the zero interest or the interest-free loans uh, value is, is on the left-hand side over the years. So what about rescheduling? Um, does this happen very often? Well, what we found when we looked at cases of rescheduling is that it's always project by project. So we haven't seen um, any cases where the Chinese just took the debt and then they sort of rescheduled the whole debt. Um, it, they do it on a project by project basis. And this very much goes along with their debt sustainability framework because um, their idea is that uh, it's, it's not the, the total uh, picture of the country, um, it's what an individual project can do. So it's an individual project sustainable. Can it repay um, the loan for that particular project or is that project itself facing difficulties rather than the whole country? And so it's a very different way of thinking about this. So as with the, the interest-free loan cancellations, these reschedulings um, very likely need to be approved by a committee. Um, that, that would be, as with the case of the interest-free loans, headed by the Ministry of Commerce, the Ministry of Finance, China Development Bank, and China Exit Bank. And we looked at these particular cases here, which I could talk about more if you're interested in the Q&A. Um, but there are very few examples where, um, where project loans or, or any kind of Chinese lending uh, was extended. And there's only one case in what we saw of a company, uh, which was CMEC, rescheduling an export seller's credit in the Republic of Congo. So again, in, in uh, Ethiopia and in Djibouti, these were for the railway loans and not for all of the debt. So, um, so I'll conclude here by saying that we don't think that asset seizure is a risk at all. Commodity price risk is significant. The hidden loans, uh, we think it's less of a risk than the paper by Horn et al. Uh, indicates, but it is out there. Um, and some of this is coming from the Chinese companies that are providing loans. And then the moral hazard risk is more significant. We don't know how significant it is. We don't know how many ministries of finance really uh, believe that the Chinese are going to cancel their debt. Uh, but clearly, it's out there as a, as a belief um, in Africa more generally. Thank you.